and more uh, down to earth in, in, in making a certain commitment, undertaking a certain commitment, there are all kinds of implicit things in it, and being aware of what I've really done is making those explicit to me. So I think that structurally, that his notion of expression as making the implicit explicit is you know, Hegel's attempt not to have that collapse have the disastrous result that you're pointing to. But um, you know, th this is exactly the, the structural issue in, in getting from Kant's picture to Hegel's picture in this vicinity that, that we ought to worry about. And that I mean, we ought to worry about not just for Kant and Hegel, but how are we going to think about uh, commitments and responsibilities? And here I think uh, the Kantian one I can't uh, sort of make work today. The Hegelian one, it seems to me, yes, it's a, you know, I think it's the later Wittgenstein that made these things visible to us again, the normative character of intentionality, the social character of that. And I think that, American pragmatism, getting into that that's the way forward. Whether it's going to have exactly the civilian instruction, I don't know, but that's exactly the issue. Peter. Um, yes, you, you um, quoted with approval the uh, Kant and Frege point that the concepts are beyond the in terms of the role of judgments or as a part of the discourse. Uh, just thinking, um, that seems to be quite important to the framework and it strikes me as being rather restrictive. Uh, there's a different kind of discourse, a different kind of thinking, uh, which is also important to content, I think. Uh, or, or to determine quantity from that sort of supposition. Think um, children, they say, let's imagine that uh, there are two children, there are two Indians behind the bush, or some mathematicians might be supposition or using uh, the context of the ducking art. Suppose the square root of two is rational and so on. That seems to me that form of reasoning, that kind of discourse is very crucial to determine the content. And that's actually okay. the, the thing that's pointed out by the uh, Frege Nietzsche quote, that anything which determined, which appears in the antecedent of a conditional uh, must play a role in determining content. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a link between conditional reasoning and suppositional reasoning. So yeah. the same point would be quote, anything that appears in a kind of suppositional proposition must play a role in determining content. Okay. I, I mean, let me say, uh, first of all, that, you know, the way I put this was more restrictive than my view. I mean, I certainly think that relevant practical reasoning, for instance, you know, contributes to conceptual, to, to conceptual content. This, and I'm not hostile to the idea that suppositional reasoning ought to go in there. On the other hand, my null hypothesis, as it were, uh, is that we ought to be Freudian about this. And Frege's view was that uh, entertaining a proposition, for instance, for the purpose of extracting or exploring consequences of it and so on, always is a matter of embedding it as the antecedent of a conditional. That is, that supposing something is uh, a way of talking about asserting conditions. And you know, I don't know whether in the end that's an adequate account of suppositional uh, reasoning. But, but, but clearly the order of explanation he's working with is one where we've got inferential relations typically you know, among asserted elements in things that claim that we couldn't draw consequences from things we didn't take to be true. You know, what he said we do instead is assert conditions, that is take them to be true. But his picture clearly is that we do reasoning with uh, unembedded sentences and then reflect those inferential commitments by asserting conditionals. And that our talk about merely supposing something is disguised talk about certain conditions when it is the antecedent. So, so that, that's at least a program for you know, keeping the assertion and inference picture and bringing in you know, the importance of supposition, but it's, all, it's going to be a matter of asserting conditionals. And you know, reductive proof, just going to understand. That just a quick remark in response, it seems to me that will be a reflection of the uh, particular kind of uh, sort of reason that Frege doesn't come to recognize where all the premises and conclusion are asserted. They didn't actually sort of recognize natural deduction systems. That came in much later. And if you, so I, my yeah, suspicion is that that's a reflection of that kind of limited views of logic. OK, that, that, I mean, that might well be right. There's a delicate issue in the vicinity, which is that uh, Descartes, in the tradition he spoke for, 
again, I want to say took it for granted that first one entertained propositions and could bring these contents before one's mind. And that then there was the question of plumping for some of them, you know, putting your, putting your mark uh, on them. And Kant's idea, I think it's Frege's idea, is it can't be like that. That, that for them to be contentful, you've got to have you know, commitments to, to many of them. Uh, and, and I think that's driving Frege's mind to say, look, merely entertaining it is something that comes later. Uh, it, it's a kind of assertion, assertion of conditions. Uh, but I don't think that acknowledging, say, natural deduction <coughs> techniques would require one to recoil all the way to the Cartesian extraordinarily entertaining. Uh, again, uh, an eternal example, Jerry Fogger, he's still got the Cartesian picture, and you can just entertain these representations, and we do the whole semantics at that level, and later on, we talk about which ones go in the belief box. Uh, and, and I think there's problems with that. Okay. One more very quick question before this. Uh, this is a question in the history of ideas. Really. I found what you had to say about uh, Kant on positive freedom fascinating, as much as you paper. paper. I thought you claimed that uh, it, it came, began with Kant. And I just wondered a little bit about that in terms of the notion being linked uh, with general ability and capacity. And so on. Of course, this was a much, much discussed uh, topic uh, from Aristotle. Especially on <coughs> and I thought I can't quite put my finger on it, but I think in some medieval thinkers there is uh, uh, advertence to the idea of this being expressive of the notion of freedom, and it's linked with a sort of philosophical theological conception of divine freedom in uh, creating the world. That the creation of the world is an expression <coughs> of a capacity to do, uh, and so it's a sort of an act of. of well, generosity or something, or, or just expressing uh, that capacity. It had to be both free and not constrained, and so, uh, yes, so yes. positive. It, well, uh, yes. uh, point, point taken, and uh, thank you for it. I actually weaseled on this. And, uh, when I said it, I said that, that Kant, uh, Kant's innovation was a special conception of positive freedom, but it was a weaseling, because I said before, you know, the tradition had typically, had typically understood freedom in negative terms, and then Kant gives us a special notion of positive freedom. And I should just you know, drop the implication that you know, it's not a special normative version that is special, but the whole idea of positive freedom, that's uh, really not accurate, as you say. So uh, I'm busted. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think the phrase free and unconstrained act of generosity is a perfect phrase to, to, to describe Bob's um, act in coming all this way uh, and taking part in both today's events and, and last night's talk. So, Bob, thanks for yet another um, wonderful talk. Well, you, you know, you saved my life from having to listen to this because I would have told this story involuntarily anyway. It's, it's <laughs> just as well. <laughs> about a 10 minute break while we set up for the movie. Um, but we need a little bit of space in the middle. We have to put a table for the projector about where you are. So if you could replace yourself with a table. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.